that uh, the message would be blessed this morning that Jacob gives and that truly your word would reach out through the Holy Spirit and touch our hearts and minds. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We're going to call Luke up now for our children's sermon. All the children, please come up for the children's service or children's sermon. So nice to see all of you this morning. I've got a question. Um, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer to answer a question for me. Toby, do you know what the word suffer means? To be suffering or to have suffered loss? Do you know what that means? It means to, it means to uh, feel bad or something. Feel bad. Does anybody else want to add to that? Uh, Nathaniel, do you want to add? Do you know what the word suf suffering means? Um, when you're like working hard and you're like sweating and stuff. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, example of suffering. I've got a couple of props here. Who knows what these are? Band-Aids, yes. And why do we wear Band-Aids? Blood on your owie? Yes, yes. Blood on your owie. Who knows what these are? Do you guys know what these are? Vitamins? Not quite. Pain pills? That is, that, that is correct. I think these, yep. Pain reliever, it says on here. And why would somebody take pain reliever? Only big people take pain reliever. <laughs> we take, big people take pain reliever because we are all suffering so much. What is this? Anybody know what this is? Like a weight. Yes. How many pounds is this? Yeah, that's why my arms are huge, right? And when I, like Nathaniel, you said that um, when you're working really hard, you're suffering yeah so all of these are things that humans have invented to either relieve suffering or um, maybe like Nathaniel said to um, suffer in order to experience some kind of long-term benefit in life we suffer in other ways too has anybody ever said something mean to you or been unkind or cruel to you called you a name uh, maybe um, said that you did something that you didn't actually do. Maybe it, maybe it's something about your relationship with Jesus. Maybe somebody has said something mean about your relationship with Jesus. In the Bible, the Bible tells us that suffering is actually a good thing. The Bible tells us that suffering is a privilege. That when we believe in Jesus, we have the privilege of suffering with him. And that can happen in many different ways. It can happen because you got an owie, maybe because you're sick or you're in pain. Maybe, said, maybe somebody said something mean or nasty to you. All of the, those examples are examples of suffering. The suffering came because of sin. Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. And here's what the Apostle Paul tells us about suffering. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, it says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. When you guys are suffering, now we or a sickness, pain, working out, or somebody said something mean to you, you can remember that your suffering is just like, it is, is similar to Jesus' suffering on the cross. When you suffer in life, 
hardships, we can remember Jesus and remember that he suffered too. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to learn what it means to suffer for your sake. Help us to count suffering as a privilege um, that makes us stronger and helps us to look to heaven as our home with you someday for forever. Thank you so much for sending Jesus to suffer on the cross, to die and rise again from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Go back to your seats. Okay, at this time we'll call Jacob forward for our message this morning. Good morning. Uh, to begin with, uh, there are some people who watch this uh, online, so just to get everything covered, I will reread the lesson for today, which is Philippians 1, 12 through 14, and 19 through 30. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for Christ's sake you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. O God, who opens the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, and the tongues of the mute. I ask that you would loose my tongue that I may speak your word. Unstop our ears that we may hear it. And open our eyes that we may behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. In our passage today, we see the Apostle Paul with a supreme confidence that is able to stand firm in the midst of persecution, imprisonment, and even death. And we don't only see it here in Paul, but his whole ministry was marked by persecution. When he was first converted, he preached Christ in the synagogues of Damascus, and the Jews plotted to kill him, but he was lowered out of the city in a basket. He was driven out of Pisidia after having great success in that region. He would have been stoned in Iconium had he not learned of the plot beforehand. He actually was stoned at Lystra and left for dead. He was beaten and imprisoned in Philippi, where this letter we read today was sent to. And mobs were rallied against him in Thessalonica and Berea. Finally, in Jerusalem, he was arrested, where he appealed to Caesar and sent to Rome, which is where we find him writing this letter from. And according to the accounts that we have from the early church, he would eventually die in Rome for his faith. And yet we see in Paul 
this firm confidence. He is imprisoned, and yet he rejoices that his imprisonment advances the gospel. He views continuing on alive as an option that is less desirable but more necessary. He views death as a step into something far better. And it's not only Paul who we see endure persecution and death for the sake of Christ. Throughout the history of the church, Christians have endured persecution. Beginning with Stephen, the first martyr we read about in Acts 7 who is stoned, and then going on in, throughout the rest of church history. We think even in the early church about Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, and he was attacked for his faith. He was a leader of the church in Smyrna. And when the proconsul urged him to, have, to think about his age, he responded, Eighty-six years I have served Christ, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And when he was threatened with fire, he said, You threaten me with fire that burns for an hour, and after a little while goes out. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and of the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. And Christians have been persecuted throughout. They have been thrown to wild beasts. They have been burned alive. They have been stoned. They have been made second-class citizens. They have been exiled from their native lands. Christians have been beaten and attacked since the time of the apostles. And even in our own day, in India and China and Africa, Christians are being persecuted and attacked and killed. And throughout history, we see the words of Christ echoed in headlines and on tombstones. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And yet, the church still stands. She has endured the persecution of tyrants, the devastations of war and famine and plagues, She's endured times of wealth and prosperity and times of abject poverty. And through it all, the church still stands. And where does this endurance come from? Let us look to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 22. Where we read, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive.
And so we see that Christianity is not merely an association of moral people who like to do good things. Rather, it is about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Take that away from Christianity, and it may still be many things, but it will cease to be Christianity. But keep this, hold on to this, Christ and his death for our sins and his resurrection, we can endure the loss of all things and still stand. As Luther wrote, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. And also remember Matthew 28 and the Great Commission, that Jesus prefaces it, by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that is just as true today as it was when he first said it. Earthly kingdoms and empires rise and fall, but Christ is the rock cut without human hands that endures while all earthly empires and powers turn into a pile of rubble. The gospel is not defeated by the attacks of the Jews, or by Paul being imprisoned in Rome. When he was driven out from one area, he merely spread the message to another place. Persecution did not stop him from working and serving. He kept on going, kept on loving his neighbor and preaching the word. And when he was imprisoned in Rome, the word spread even to the imperial guard and even to the very household of Caesar. And that's not to mention the others who began to preach because of Paul's imprisonment. Persecution and attacks cannot stop the gospel. It cannot stop the word of God or the kingdom of God. And we see the same thing throughout church history. As it has often been said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church because it seems that the more the church is persecuted, the more it continues to grow. No matter how much the kings of the earth plot against the Lord and against his Christ, they will never succeed. Because Christ is over all. God is king, and he holds a rod of iron that can smash the nations like jars of clay. And even though, even as we remember this, that he does hold a rod of iron to smash the nations, we should remember that his kingdom is first and foremost about salvation. Jesus did not go to the cross and rise again simply to show off how powerful he is. He did it because whether it is by persecution or by old age, the grave is the fate of each and every one of us. We are all born at odds with our maker. This sin will manifest itself in different ways and different people, but it's there in each and every one of us. We don't love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't respect God in the way that he has ordered things. Perhaps the most pernicious of all is that we don't think we need a Savior in the first place. And we should remember in all of this what God spoke by John the Baptist when he declared of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we should remember that we are not so much higher or better than the rest of the world, that we have no sin for which we need forgiveness and salvation. We should remember the words of 1 John 1.8, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And as we remember and recognize and believe God that we are sinners, we should also remember 1 John 1.9, which says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christ came and died not merely as a show of power, but to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Jesus took all of my sin and all of your sin and the death that we deserve on the cross, and he triumphed over them in his resurrection. He freely offers this eternal life and perfect righteousness before God, the forgiveness of all of your sins to all who trust in him. So acknowledge your sin, confess it to God, 
and believe this word that I tell you today, that Christ bore all of your sins on the cross, and that whoever believes in him, even though they die, yet will they live forever. Stand firm in this confidence and confession of the good news of Christ, knowing that no prison, no tyrant, no death, no matter how cruel, can take away the death of Christ, nor can they shove Jesus back into the grave. Returning to our passage in verse 27 and following, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear from you, hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. And so, while we continue to live, let us follow the example of Paul and live our lives in service and love to our neighbor in whatever role we have, whether it be teaching, whether it be as a parent caring for children, whatever role we are in, let us use our lives as long as we have them to love and to serve our neighbor. And also, let us remember, as we are confessing our sins and remembering that we are sinners, we should remember that it is not fitting for those who have been saved from sin to continue living in it. So we ought to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. As we re and uh, as we read about in Ephesians 4, uh, starting in verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the, tru the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one, one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so in life, we should live our lives in service and repentance and faith. And when we face death, whether it be a young death through persecution, or old age, or whatever other cause. Let us stand firm and confident in Christ. Whatever we do, whatever we face, let us know and remember that Christ has gone before us, and that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's now uh, pray the uh, prayer that our Lord 
uh, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.